So as you can obviously see, we are starting class here on Google Classroom. And if you missed today's class, we learned about Federalist 78. And if you look at Federalist 78, the main focus is right here, the synopsis of the Federalist Papers. This is going to be your first major writing assignment. But if you miss class, you don't know what 78 is all about. So if you click here in class, we read Federalist 78, but I took the liberty of breaking down the big points. So for our sake, so this video doesn't last forever, I'm going to cut right to the chase. The big headings should give you a direction what Federalist 78 was all about. And no surprise, it was written by Alexander Hamilton, and it talked about judicial power, the judiciary, that third branch of government. And in 78, it said the judiciary must be independent. That is huge, okay? It has to be a separate entity left to its own devices. Again, the independence of the judiciary is indispensable. They reinforced this point. They hammered this point home to really reinforce this big idea, an independent judiciary. Now, a limited constitution requires independent courts. For the constitution to function well, it is essential that these courts are independent. Hopefully, I've made my point. I know they certainly did in Federalist 78. Now, this idea is powerful. Now, in 78, it alluded to the fact that the judicial branch was not the strongest of the three branches. In prior Federalist papers, we learned the concern was the legislative branch would get too powerful. However, this is a very powerful tool. So to make a law, it is not easy at all. It will either start at the House or start in the Senate, and it has to go through committees, and they add items, they delete items. It's a big hullabaloo. So it goes through the House, then it has to go to the Senate, and they do the same thing with committees and additions and subtractions. And then it goes to the president's desk, and the president may not sign it. The president may veto it. So it's a production to make a law. But the nine Supreme Court justices can look at that law and say, well, it doesn't follow the Constitution. It is not a law. Now, that's powerful, and you better have some good people. Those nine people better be rock solid if they're making decisions like that. So another big point from Federalist 78, the Constitution is the supreme law, and this is important. The buck stops there, period. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And judges must judge that Constitution. Their job is to really know that Constitution, backwards, forwards, and sideways, and make judgments that adhere to what is written in the Constitution. And the judiciary alone interprets the law. Hey, judiciary, you have one job. Interpret the law. Executive branch, legislative branch, leave it alone. It's the judiciary alone that interprets the law. And for those who were concerned that the judicial branch would get way too powerful and turn into like an oligarchy where they can control, you know, the uh, direction of this country, in 78, they reinforced, it's not the judiciary. They're not the supreme law of the land. It's the Constitution. Again, the Constitution is the be-all, end-all when it comes to law. Okay? Now, courts exercise judgment, not will. So, can the legislative branch enforce their will? Absolutely. Now, in theory, it should come from the will of the people. The people want a law passed, and they go to their representative or their senator, that sort of thing. Executive branch, they have some power but the courts, just judgment. Now, in the past, have there been some activist courts that may have hugged the line or even crossed the line where they're not doing this, they're imposing their will? You can make that argument. But theoretically, in Federalist 78, judge, don't enforce your will. And there's a need for permanent judges. Now, we need to think about this. The House, two years. Okay, presidents, four years. 
senators, six years. If they don't do what makes the people happy, they will get voted out. So to a point, they have to remain popular. They might have to make a decision that goes against their own ethics or what they want to do to stay in office. But our judges might have to make an unpopular decision that adheres to the Constitution. Therefore, these people can't be campaigning and trying to be popular with the people and have marketing campaigns. They need to be left alone. They're in perpetuity as long as they want, either retirement or death. And the theory behind it all, they're going to be more objective that way, okay, because they're not campaigning. They're simply interpreting the Constitution. Now, judicial independence guards constitutional rights. Think of the, the judiciary as a protector, okay? There are rights in the Constitution, and if these rights get violated, it's the judiciary sh that should right the wrong. That's the point of them. And an independent judiciary guards against unjust and partial laws. That is the hope. That was the persuasion that was taking place in Federalist 78 to say this was going to be the case. And in 78, it says the existence of independent judiciary will mitigate unjust laws. Now, these courts are bound by precedents. These precedents are very powerful. If you don't know what a precedent is, it's a decision that is made and it applies to all people in perpetuity until it is changed. Now, I would make an argument the most important precedent that we run our country by is Marbury versus Madison. That is 1803. That's a long time ago, but that precedent still remains. Here's a very obvious one. You know, Clarenceville High School is a very diverse school. We have all sorts of people that are in my classroom, which is very cool about teaching at Clarenceville. But that really stems from Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. That was a long time ago, but that precedent remains, and courts need to be bound by these precedents. And judges have to be a very skilled and honest group. These are, it's very important that we have the best and brightest legal minds in our judiciary, okay? Because if they're not skilled and honest, some bad things can happen. And in 78, they say a permanent tenure will attract qualified judges. We'll uh, reach that objective of having our best and brightest legal minds making these decisions. Okay, so that is 78 in a nutshell. And going back to Google Classroom, here's the big assignment, okay? And do your best. This is your first major writing assignment. And I'm going to read this to you and uh, explain it a little bit. And even if you're absent, please go through those Federalist Papers and do your best work. So it reads, I understand, I understand that these Federalist Papers are challenging reads. I get that they're hard. I do. I appreciate your efforts and for you doing your best. I really do. Now, due to the importance of these, I'm going to ask you to do the following. Provide a synopsis of Federalist Papers 10, 51, 70, and 78. Why were these papers so significant in the formation of our nation? Please write it in AP style. And what I mean by that is an adequate scale. Don't just give me a little blurb. These aren't class notes. Go deep. Go into some detail. Review what you've learned about these four Federalist Papers and write to the best of your ability. And if you're watching this because you were sick, when you're feeling better, when you head back, please turn it in when you get back. And um, again, you know, the se Paper 78 with the judiciary, it, it's important. Okay, these decisions, these precedents, having solid Supreme Court justices will make or break this country. And I hope you got that point from either reading or listening to me or both or whatever. Hey, however you get that point, it's good by me. So appreciate you watching.